Good morning, everybody. Good morning, Facebook. Good morning, Texas. Good morning. Good morning, world. Welcome, everybody. I'm so excited to be sharing what I have to share today. Um, it brings me great joy. It bring, bring, brings me great pleasure to share this news with you today of all days. Uh, boy, my goodness. Happy Easter, brothers and sisters. And uh, good morning, Michael Tishnell. Welcome you and Sally. I'm sure she is by your side. Uh, before we go any further, I want to uh, share this with those that I share with every week. And let me do that right now, and then we'll get started. So glad you could be with me today. Um, whoever's joining us, I am glad you're here. One second, I will be right here. Okay, yeah, I celebrate uh, Easter today. I'm sharing with a group called Faith Fitness on uh, Facebook, which I enjoy that group led by Max, Maxwell Rondale, an old friend of mine, a brother in Jesus. He was, he was a, uh, a boss of mine years ago god recently just in the last year or so re, uh, reunited us through facebook and um other than having a work relationship together uh, in common we have jesus christ in common and it's wonderful to visit with old friends and um now have a camaraderie you know in in the brother being brothers in christ and I really enjoy that with him. The same goes for Michael Tishnell, an old high school friend of mine. And I don't think we said one lick about Jesus Christ as we worked together at Hardee's there in Carlisle, off the Carlisle Pike there. Um, but now we're, we're uh, brothers in Christ. Um, and uh, Jack is a newer friend of mine in, in life. I met him, I think, in 2014, maybe. I'm not sure when, maybe the last six years. But he's a great brother in Christ, and he's joined us on our Bible team calls on Monday. And so, good morning, Bill Foster. Speaking of old friends, another high school classmate of mine, Bill Foster. We knew each other in high school. We weren't close, but now we're closer than ever, Bill Foster and I. Because of the Lord, the Lord has a way of doing that with people. He takes relationships, and he brings us closer together. We're so closer together than in, in, in many ways, uh, Christian brotherhood and sisterhood is better, closer than blood, blood and f flesh. I've met so many people that um, are, are disin, um, they're, they're disappointed with their fleshly relationships because you have this expectation in your blood, your mother and dad and your, or your, your siblings or your, your sons and daughters, and we we put a lot of expectation and and we desire closeness with our siblings and with our parents that maybe they were unable to give us, right? Um, but what Jesus does, He changes all of that as He melts our heart. He gives us a love for other people that we never had before, and so Jesus absolutely makes it clear that our relationships with, with him and his body, those followers in Jesus, are so much more significant um, uh, in, in, in the body of Christ than flesh and blood. So thankfully, my mom and dad are brothers and sisters. They are in Christ, as well as my uh, older brother. He's four years older than me, Jeff Pittman. Um, so I, that's, I have a lot to be thankful for with those relationships, but I know people and families that just, they're just uh, segmented and um, in many ways dis disintegrated. And so 
Good morning, Mom. Speaking of, Darlene Pittman has joined us. Now we can get started. Mom's here. Um, God bless you all. Thank you so much for joining me today. Easter message. Let's go to the Lord in prayer before we get started. Father in heaven, your name be praised. We thank you so much, almighty God. You have you've created everything. You are the creator of all things, seen and unseen. And we give you glory. We give you praise. We give you thanks for another breath. And if we are breathing deep today, we have so much to be thankful for in a day that's clouded by an unknown and a a microscopic thing uh, such as this virus, Lord. And we just pray. We pray, first of all, for those that are sick. Lord, please bring them to health. Lord, we pray for those that have suffered loss. We pray, Lord, that they be restored um, through your healing if they've lost a spouse. And even if they've lost um, someone to... Uh, the virus, or even if they've lost them to, you know, whatever it is, wh whether it be cancer or a car wreck or um, some other timely or untimely death, whatever the case may be, Lord, we pray for those that are mourning today, suffering loss of any way. Uh, Lord, we pray for those that are just um, uh, confused right now with all this stuff. It's bringing such uncertainty into their lives. Maybe maybe they've lost um, uh, their work, a job. Maybe they've lost a business. Um, Lord, we just pray. We pray for those that are working nonstop as essential employees, or especially those in healthcare, those that are nurses, doctors, EMTs, those people that are on the front lines. They don't know what they're um, exposed to, Lord, on a daily basis. And Lord, we just pray for those people. Lord, there's just so much to pray for. And Lord, I want to lift this message up to you. It's time to celebrate Easter. This weekend marks the uh, the occurrence, the event that um, the Bible speaks of, the event that separated all of history, the event of you dying and being resurrected on, on the third day. Lord, we want to focus on that today. Lord, help us to understand, help us to um, comprehend uh, what I have to share. Help me to deliver, help those that are here receive, help them to put aside any kind of distraction and focus wholeheartedly on these words today that I will be sharing. I thank you, Lord, for this message that we might share it together. Help us to know you more. Help us to be admired, to admire you all the more today as we focus on your coming, your dying, and your resurrecting, Lord. I pray that you soften the hearts of those that watch this. Might they come to repentance and a closer walk with you. At the very least, Lord, let us be walking closer to you today than when we came here. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. So, so glad you could join me today. Please feel free to participate. Shout an amen. Uh, shout whatever you have to shout as I continue. We have a lot to cover, and let me get into it. We're already 12 minutes past. Let's, uh, let's get into this. What makes this holiday, what we call Easter, significant? Today we will discuss the, dis the significance of three events, his coming, his dying, and his resurrecting, resurrection. In a nutshell, in brief, if I had one thing to say about Jesus Christ, you can sum it up by 1 Timothy 2. Sorry, I want to talk about this. This is the guideline I go by. This is how you could follow along at home and read it as I go through it. I know audibly I have a hard time re, uh, uh, hearing things without it being in front of me. I get distracted easily. Um, these notes are in the uh, in the original post. If you, pa you it, it, maybe you could pause your video to print it out to enjoy it with me. If you're live, <laughs> I don't know if you'll be able to catch up. 
Um, anyway, so I just wanted to make sure you knew this was there. Thank you. Um, okay, so in brief, in a nutshell, um, about Jesus Christ is um, in, found in 1 Timothy 2, verse 5. For there, for there is one God, one mediator, who can reconcile God and humanity, the man Jesus Christ. There is one man who can reconcile God and humanity. And there's two reasons for that. He is God and he's man. He's the only buddy, he's the only person that ever fit that description, God and man. And that's what makes him perfect. That's what makes him the mediator. Um, this is Christianity in a nutshell. Jesus sets himself apart. That the Almighty Creator sets us apart from the world through his Son, Jesus Christ. We are now living in the year of our Lord, 2020. We are reminded every day of Jesus Christ because our calendars are marked by his arrival. It is the year 2020 because it's been 2020 years since his coming to earth. And that's how we know the date by the year of our Lord. No one has ever walked the planet that can compare with him. So in Philippians 2, verse 6, though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. In other words, he was humble. He modeled humility so that we might be humble. So let's go into the significance of his coming. I want to share a bit of prophecy that's mentioned in the Old Testament. And what makes the Bible so doggone unique is the prophecy, the prophecies that were mentioned in the Old Testament being fulfilled in the New Testament and continue to being fulfilled today. And we don't have time to talk about all the uh, all the prophecies. Good morning, Ernest. Welcome. Thank you so much for sharing. Uh, Pastor Brother Larry Pittman, I pray for this message to be brought forward with spiritual clarity. Amen. Thank you, Ernest. Ernest is an old friend from uh, from a, 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 a marketing company that my wife and I met him through, and uh, he, we've been in touch. And I'm thank thank you that you can join me today, Ernest. Welcome. Um, so we want to talk about the significance of his coming and prophecy. We could talk all day about prophecy of the Old Testament and the New Testament, um, but for now we're going to focus again on his coming. So there's a number of uh, I'm only going to list two for his coming. Good morning, Michelle Kroll. Welcome. Glad you could join me with your smile. Thank you for, I love the emoticons because I know you're smiling, Michelle, and that's good. Thank you for uh, chiming in here, Michelle. Uh, okay, so I could, like I said, I could go on and on about prophecy. Did you know there's about 300, there's over 300 prophecies about Jesus Christ in the Old Testament? It's remarkable, and I've only selected two. Um, about his coming. So in, in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, for, for a child is born to us, a son is given to us. And that is Jesus Christ. Micah 5, verse 2, but you, O Bethlehem, Ephrata, are only a small village among all the people of Judah, yet a ruler from Israel, whose origins are in the distant past, will come from you on my behalf. Wow, isn't that amazing? The father says through the prophet Micah that he's going to send a son or a ruler of Israel who is his son. See, you get these bits and pieces through prophecy, and now we can put it all together. And so I love looking at, you know, through uh, through the, it's like a puzzle. It's a great puzzle. And once you put the piece of, piece of the, these prophecy puzzles together, it's, it's nothing short of remarkable. But he's saying uh, the origins of his past will come from you, from Judah, from Bethlehem, which we know is true, um, on my behalf. Jesus came on behalf of his father. So um, I want to use John 1 to talk about the coming, um, to talk about Jesus himself a bit. In the beginning, John 1, verse 1, we've all heard these words before. I just, I just, these never get old for me. Like, like anything does from scripture. Um, John 1 verse 1, in the beginning, the word already existed. The word was with God. The word was God. He existed in the beginning with God. God created everything through him and nothing was created except through him. 
The word gave life to everything that was created. And his life brought light to everyone. And then I'm going to jump down to verse 14 where it says, So the word became human and made his home among us. He was full of unfailing love and faithfulness. And we have seen his glory, the glory of the Father's one and only Son. Praise the Lord. That's who Jesus is. So now I want to talk about um, his after his arrival. And um, the messages that started coming as he began his public ministry. And I want to start by the testimony of John the Baptist. And I'm going to share the testimony of Jesus. And we're going to talk about the significance of his arrival. This is the gospel. And this is the gospel prior to him giving his life on the cross. He called it the gospel as he sent his, uh, his apostles out. So John the Baptist says, Later in that same chapter, John 1, verse 29, the next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He is the one I was talking about when I said, A man is coming after me who is far greater than I am, for he existed long before me. So you get this picture through many scriptures of the New Testament, that Jesus came before, before Abraham, I am. Uh, John the Baptist uh, concurs. He says, for he existed long before me. Um, and and it, 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 it's, uh, um, it's in step with Micah 5, um, you, whose origins are in the distant past. Jesus was born on this planet, but he existed long before that. And that is significant. Um, God has come to live with his creation, the good news of his arrival. Matthew 3, verse 1, In those days John the Baptist came, preaching in the wilderness of Judea, and saying, Repent, because the kingdom of heaven has come near. And all of history, from the time of creation, this, is, this has never happened, for God to come to earth in the form of a man. And that's why this is significant. And we can't even compare in the last hundred years. It, it, it dwarfs in to comparison of the, the previous 6,000 years before. Um, we can't even wrap our minds around the time involved. But 2,000 years ago, it was time for Jesus to come. It was time for God to send his son. Um, Matthew 4, verse 17, from then on, Jesus began to preach, repent because the kingdom of God has come near. So this is what they started teaching, started preaching, that the kingdom of God, God has come near. Therefore produce fruit consistent with repentance. Matthew 3, verse 10, the ax is already at the root of the trees. Therefore every tree that doesn't produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. So the good news also comes with a warning. He's saying to get on the same page with God. Repent, turn to him, and that will produce good fruit. Your repentance to God and giving your life to him, turning to him, will produce fruit. Um, Luke 2, these, these are the words of the angels that appear to the shepherds. Luke 2, verse 8, that night there were shepherds staying in the fields nearby, guarding their flocks of sheep. Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them. They were terrified, but the angel reassured them, don't be afraid, he said. I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem the city of David. Good news, Jesus came, he arrived. Luke 3, verse 7, he then said to the crowds who came out to be baptized by him, brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Therefore produce fruit consistent with repentance, and don't start saying to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. 
For I tell you that God is able to raise up children for Abraham from these stones. The axe is already at the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree that doesn't produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. So he's talking to these Pharisees, these religious leaders that saying, because we're children of Abraham, we're saved. Likewise today, don't be telling yourself, my Christians, my parents were Christians, I'm saved. Don't say my father was a pastor, I'm saved. Don't say those things. Don't say I go to church every weekend, I must be saved. I go to Bible study, therefore I must be saved. No, that's not how it works. Therefore, every tree that doesn't produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. The axe is already at the root of the trees. We must repent and turn to God. Give him our life so that we can bear fruit that's worthy of that repentance. In Peter, when Peter is uh, given the spirit, all the people in the room, the 120 that was praying, the brothers and sisters that were praying, they were told to wait after Jesus was resurrected. When they delivered their message, their first message that led 3,000 to be saved that day, Acts 2, verse 37, when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what should we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, each of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Paul, in Acts 17, Verse 30, therefore have overlooked, therefore having overlooked the times of ignorance, God now commands everyone, sorry, God now commands all people everywhere to repent because he has set a day when he is going to judge the world in righteousness by the man he has appointed. He has provided proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. Thus, his coming to earth to summarize, to summarize this first section, his coming to earth to summarize meant that the kingdom of God is near, our Savior is born, and we need to repent. It means to change your mind, and it's, it's not a, a repentance is not a something you can do really on your own. It's brought by the Spirit. We don't come to him, so pray for repentance. Pray, if you don't feel it, pray that you feel a, a sorrow of the way you've been living, of the way you've been messing up in your life. Say, Lord, I want to live for you. I want to start working with you and for you. I want to start um, living my life in worship of you because he's worthy of our worship. Nothing else is worthy of our worship. The economy is not worthy of our worship. The government is not worthy of our worship. Our work is not worthy of our worship. Our family is not worthy of our worship. Creation, being outdoors, is not worthy of our worship. Those might be good things to spend time in, but we must be focused in worshiping the one who created us, the one who knows us intimately, and we must give our lives to him because he's worth it. And and, and you'll be given so much more joy, so much more security, so much more peace and love from the Father that you won't want to look back. I'm telling you, repent and give your life to him. So now I want to talk about the significance of his dying. And we're going to spend a little bit time here. Um, and then we're going to devote the rest of our time this morning with the significance of his resurrection, which is truly Easter. But I don't want to do an Easter service without acknowledging uh, Christ's need for everybody in their life. So the prophecy of his dying, uh, one prophecy is found in Isaiah 53. If you've not read that chapter recently, and you might want to start there, the tail end of 52, where it talks about his servant. Isaiah 53, verse 5 and 6 is all I'm going to read right here, but that's all we need to get the point across. But he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. All of us, like sheep, have strayed away. We have left God's path to follow our own. Yet the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. He took all of our sins on him at the cross when he died. 
So I could talk the rest of the time on, on the significance of Christ dying on the cross. But I want to just bring one uh, passage to light. Uh, Romans 5, verse 6 through 11, where Paul really hammers this home. I love the conciseness of this passage. Romans 5, verses 6 through 11. When we were utterly helpless, Christ came at just the right time and died for us sinners. Now, most people would not be willing to die for an upright person, though someone might perhaps be willing to die for a person who is especially good. But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. And since we have been made right in God's sight by the blood of Christ, he will certainly save us from God's condemnation. For since our friendship with God was restored by the death of his son, while we were still his enemies, we will certainly be saved through the life of his son. So now we can rejoice in our wonderful new relationship with God because our Lord Jesus Christ has made us friends of God. Is that not incredible or what? We mere humans who are made of dust, who are here today, gone tomorrow, like we're nothing, when we consider our lives and the insignificance of us as people. Although in his eyes, we're special. In his eyes, we're worthy of his death on the cross. Can you wrap your head around that? We are nothing in comparison to God. Who's going to remember Larry Pittman 100 years from now? No one. Who remembers anyone in all of history? Those, unless those that are really unique, those that are really famous. But God remembers us. And you need to be in the Word of God to really, really grasp this. And I encourage all of you to get into the Word of God so that you get it, so that you can understand it. The more you read it, the more you'll be blown away. The more you read the Word of God, the more you'll be drawn to Him. The more you read the Word of God, the more you'll be in awe of Him. And you must approach it in prayer. You cannot read the Bible without a spiritual walk with Him. Uh, through Jesus Christ, we have good news of one's being able to be reconciled with God. Amen. He gives us the ability. His what he did on the cross has given us the ability. The, the, the curtain was torn at the time of his cross. The temple um, that was there in Jerusalem in, in that day, um, there was a curtain. And you can read about this in the Old Testament where uh, the curtain separated the common temple area with the Holy of Holies. And so the Holy of Holies, no one dared go in there. I think except for the high priest once a year or something like that. I don't remember all the details. But nevertheless, when Christ died on the cross, that, that curtain was torn. The veil was torn, giving us the symbolically, it's symbolic, giving us access to God himself. And the New Testament hammers at home. Amen, Jack. Thank you for sharing. His dying on the cross paid for our sins. Now I want to attain with half an hour left. Let's spend the rest of our time talking about his resurrection. So there is some prophecy of his resurrection. And I'm going to share where they are in the New Testament. And if you recall, the uh, religious leaders of Jesus' day asked him for a sign. They said, give us a sign. No, he's doing all these wonderful miracles. He's bringing people back from the dead. He's giving people sight. He's healing the lame. Um, he's restoring uh, uh, hearing. And, um, and they're saying, give us a sign. And that's why it was ridiculous. That's why Jesus rebuked them and say, I only gave you one sign. Um, and that's, that's through Jonah. That's sort of the story of Jonah. So in Jonah chapter 1, Verse 17, now the Lord had arranged for a great fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was inside the fish for three days and three nights. Jonah 2, verse 1 and 2 say, then Jonah prayed to the Lord as God from inside the fish. He said, I cried out to the Lord in my great trouble, 
and he answered me. I called to you from the land of the dead, and Lord, you heard me. I love that. That's Jesus when he, he died, right? And he was resurrected. It's there in Jonah. And then let's go on to another uh, passage in the Old Testament, another prophecy, Psalm 40, which is referenced in Hebrews 10, verse 5. So Psalm 40 says, it's from the, for the choir director, it's a Psalm of David. Um, and I'm reading just the first three verses. Psalm 41 says, I waited patiently for the Lord to help me. And he turned to me and heard me cry. He lifted me out of the pit of despair, out of the mud and the mire. He set my feet on solid ground. He steadied me as I walked along. He has given me a new song to sing, a hymn of praise to our God. Many will see what he has done and be amazed. They will put their trust in the Lord. And I love that. Many will see what he has done. Many will see that he was resurrected and they will put their trust in the Lord. And likewise, I don't want to uh, miss the significance of this psalm um, in relation to our own salvation. Because let me just uh, uh, talk about my own walk in that I was in despair at one time. I was walking through mire and mud at one time, and he pulled me out of that. He put me on solid ground. He heard my cry because I desperately needed to hear from him. I knew about God for almost for a lot of my life. And I, I failed to uh, really have that walk with him, that relationship with him. And it wasn't until 38, and you can see my testimony, my um, video of my testimony is in the original post here, and you can see that. So I can relate. All believers that are walking with Jesus should be able to relate to this passage, should be able to say, I was once miserable. I was once um, mired in my own sin, in my own filth. And um, what God has done for me is nothing short of amazing. Our testimony should amaze our friends. They should say, wow, Jack is a different person. Michael, he is not the same man I knew in high school. Bill Foster, that guy's not the same. And, and so we should be able to have that testimony. And look, um, the, the closer you get to God, your testimony is perpetual. It, 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 it's not set in stone. What I'm saying is the closer you get to God, the better your testimony gets. And you can also uh, say what's happened last week, let alone what happened uh, 14 years ago. In other words, your testimony continues to be written, right? So what's said about Moses before being in the wilderness and before being called by God is he is a murderer. That's his story. He's a murderer. And, and now God's called him to lead his children. So our testimonies are not, um, uh, are, are constantly evolving as we evolve to be more like Christ. Our testimony grows. I'm not the same person I was last week. I'm not the same person I was two years ago. My, what I'm saying is there's hope for you. Even if you don't know Jesus yet, you can have a testimony of your own if you accept him and come to him. And so you too can be changed and he'll give you a changed heart if you submit yourself to him. And for those believers that have maybe been walking with him but haven't truly been transformed, you he can still transform you today. And I want to give that hope of transformation because many in our pupil in our in our pul in our I could say pulpits too many in our pews that call themselves Christians don't have much of a testimony today because they have not drawn near God and that was me for many years calling myself a Christian yet not having a significant testimony we need to devote ourselves to God get into the word diligently and get in a life of prayer so that we might be transformed it doesn't happen overnight. Sometimes it can happen overnight, but for me it wasn't. It was a gradual progression as I drew closer, drew closer to him. Psalm 16, um, verses 9 through 11, 
No wonder my heart is glad and I rejoice. My body rests in safety for you will not leave my soul among the dead or allow your Holy One to rot in the grave. You will show me the way of life, granting me the joy of your presence and the pleasures of living with you forever. So there is a picture of resurrection. This is referenced in Acts 2, verse 25, where it's, it's David's given the credit. The Holy Spirit spoke through David as he wrote Psalm 16. For you will not leave my soul among the dead or allow your Holy One to ride in the grave. He's talking about himself and he's talking about Jesus Christ. Talking about not riding in the, uh, not rotting in the grave. And again, we should all relate to this. We should all be so grateful that we have this hope of not rotting in the grave. You, he will not leave our soul among the dead. Can I get an amen? Thank you, Michael. I appreciate those words. Michael said, amen, you grow with God. Amen. Thank you for chiming in. I love your comments. About the resurrection. Okay, so we're going to um, lead up to the close. So much to share. My biggest challenge for these messages is... Uh, whittling down the scripture that comes to mind to share to focus really um john 2 verse 19 through 22 all right jesus replied destroy this temple and in three days i will raise it up what they exclaimed it has taken 46 years to build this temple and you can rebuild it in three days but when jesus said this temple he meant his own body after he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered he had said this, and they believed both the scriptures and what Jesus had said. So I love this because, first of all, Jesus is uh, uh, talking about this temple in his own body because we need to recognize that our body is a temple of the living God. It's not the church we go to. It's not where we go to worship. It's here. You can worship at home. Um, and you should worship at home. You should worship wherever you go. If you read about Abraham before any church, before any temple, Abraham worshiped wherever he went. He was the model of faith. And as you read about Abraham, you learn about how he worshiped here, worshiped there. He set up altars and he worshiped. We should be worshiping at home, um, which ties in nicely today with the uh, lockdown orders. And, uh, you know, people uh, need to worship at home anyway, regardless of the church to go to. So um, God has taught me how to worship anywhere, and we need to learn the same. So he means uh, his temple is his body, he was, and he was after he was raised from the dead. So um, John eleven twenty five. 25, this is when Lazarus dies before he raises Lazarus from the, from the dead. Uh, John eleven twenty five. 25, Jesus told her, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me, even after dying. I'm sorry, any, anyone who believes in me will live even after dying. So these are prophecies of his resurrection prior to his resurrection. Mark 8, verse 31. Then he began to teach them that it was necessary for the Son of Man to suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and scribes, be killed and rise in, in three days. There you go. He says himself, he's going to die, and he's going to be risen for three days. So he's prophesying his own resurrection. Okay, so now let's go to uh, Luke 20, verses 35 through 38. But in the age to come, those worthy of being raised from the dead will neither marry nor be given in marriage. So he's talking about this to the Sadducees. The Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection. They didn't believe in angels or spirits. Um, it's pretty sad. These were liberal theologians back in the day when Jesus walked. Um, and he's in, in they're coming up with these crazy ideas about marriage and, uh, you know, people losing, uh, um, people not, you know, women not having their, uh, babies and they marry the brother. I'm not going to, sorry, I got it off on a distraction. Um, so Jesus' explanation in Luke 20, verse 35, but in the age to come, 
those worthy of being raised from the dead will neither marry nor be given in marriage, and they will never die again. In this respect, they will be like angels. They are children of God and children of the resurrection. But now as to whether the dead will be raised, even Moses proved this when he wrote about the burning bush. Long after Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob had died, he referred to the Lord as the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. So he is the God of the living, not the dead, for they are, al they are all alive to him. So we're dead to the world. We're dead to the world now spiritually, but we're alive. I'm still um, breathing today, but I will die in a physical, natural death, but I won't be dead to God. I'll be alive to him. So that's what that means. It's a different realm. It's a spiritual realm. And so I love that passage because we learn a lot. We'll become like angels. We'll be given a heavenly, a divine body. Um, we'll be children of God and children of the resurrection. I love that. I love thinking about, uh, you know, what, what's that going to be like? And that gets me excited, guys. Um, there's hope um, in the life to come. There is no hope on this planet. If you haven't figured that out by now, there's no hope here. It's all temporal. We might hope for a job. We might hope for something to come next week. We might hope for that letter in the mail we've been dying to get from a friend, whatever. Well, that, that those days are gone. But nevertheless, we have hope for things on this earth. But in all comparison, there is no hope on this earth compared to living eternally with God. And we ought to set our minds focused on that. Um, Matthew 28. Verses 28. Uh, wait, 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 wait. Oh, I screwed up. I screwed up my notes, guys. Um, shoot. <laughs> I, I, I uh, took out a reference of where I'm at, so I don't even know where I'm reading. I think it's uh, Luke. Uh, no, you know, you know what? It's, I think it's Matthew 28. Yeah. I'm sorry. It is not a screw up. It's Matthew 28. And what happens is when you uh, copy and paste from uh, a Bible app, when it's verse one, it doesn't really say one. It just says the chapter number. So I put, it's, it says Matthew 28, 28, and that's not what it is. It's Matthew 28. And I didn't, I didn't take out one of the 28. Sorry. Okay. Matthew 28, verse one, early on Sunday morning, as the new day was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went out to visit the tomb. Suddenly there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, rolled aside the stone, and sat on it. His face shone with like lightning, and his clothing was as white as snow. The guards shook with fear when they saw him, and they fell into a dead faint. Then the angel spoke to the woman, Don't be afraid, he said. I know you were looking for Jesus, who was crucified. He isn't here. He is risen from the dead, just as he said would happen. Come, see where his body was lying. And now go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And he is going ahead to you, uh, of you. He is going ahead of you to Galilee. You will see him there. Remember what I have told you. So this is the actual uh, occurrence of just after the resurrection. Notice that Jesus is already gone. He went. He didn't need, Jesus didn't need the stone to be rolled away from the tomb. In other words, when um, the women got there, suddenly there was a great earthquake for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, rolled aside the stone and sat on it. Jesus was already gone from the temple. Do you understand what I'm saying? It's not like they saw his resurrection. The, temp, the rock, the stone was already rolled away and he was not there. And the angel of the Lord told them really what 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 just happened. His his body, he's gone. You just missed them, <laughs> right? So um, uh, wouldn't that have been something to uh, witness those angels? Oh my gosh! Um, can you imagine Mary Magdalene and uh, Jesus' mother uh, ever? 
what what a memory to be etched in stone on your mind and your heart to witness these angels and say, don't be afraid. Oh my gosh. I mean, try to wrap your head around that. I mean, they were never the same as a result of that. And then they got to see Jesus um, soon after that, his resurrected body. Okay. So um, 1 Corinthians 15. I'm sorry, it's 1 Corinthians 15, um, verses 12 through uh, 23. And then we're going to uh, wrap it up in summary. So 1 Corinthians 15, verse 12. But tell me this, since we preach that Christ rose from the dead, why are some of you saying that there will be no resurrection of the dead? For if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, then all of our preaching is useless and our and your faith is useless. And we apostles would all be lying about God, for we have all we have said that God raised from Christ from the grave. But that you but that can't be true if there is no resurrection of the dead. And if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is useless and you are still guilty of your sins. In that case, all who have died believing in Christ are lost. And if our hope is in Christ, and if our hope in Christ is only for this life, we are more to be pitied than anyone in the world. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. He is the first of a great harvest of all who have died. So you see, just as death came into the world through a man, now the resurrection from the dead has begun through another man. Just as everyone dies because we all belong to Adam, everyone who belongs to Christ will be given new life. But there is an order of this resurrection. Christ was raised as the first of the harvest. Then all who belong to Christ will be raised when he comes back. So I love this explanation and making it abundantly clear that if the resurrection never happened, we're hopeless. Our message is useless. We are to be pitied more than anyone in the world. But he's making it also clear, and he goes on, and we're going to talk about in this chapter the witnesses of the resurrection. So <clears throat> I tell you, the Bible keeps on getting better and better. The more you read it, the more you're impressed the more you say, wow, I mean, it, 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 it just keeps on getting better. And so now I want to wrap up. In summary, um, there's two passages. I love the, uh, the beginning part of 1 Corinthians 15. I want to read that. And then I'm going to read a summary from 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 4. And uh, before before I finish, I just want to say, if you have any prayers that need answered, um, I'd love you to, to put them in there. Even if this is a recording, um, you can feel free to send me uh, your prayer request because I don't want that to be lost today because there's just, there's just a lot of pain and confusion going on. Um, and uh, God can help you with that. So I want to... Go back to 1 Corinthians 15. I love this passage because it, it, it sums up everything we've been talking today nicely. It's, it's a great uh, place you can review for the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ is coming, his dying, and his resurrection. Um, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 1. Let me now remind you, dear brothers and sisters, of the good news I preached to you before. You welcomed it then, and you still stand firm in it. If this is good news, it is it is this good news that saves you if you continue to believe the message I told you. Unless, of course, you believe something that was never true in the first place. Verse 3, I pass on to you what was most important and what had also been passed on to me. Christ died for our sins, just as the scripture said. He was buried and he was raised from the dead on the third day. Just as the scripture said, he was seen by Peter and then by the twelve. 
After that, he was seen by more than 500 of his followers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have died. Then he was seen by James and later by all the apostles. Last of all, as though I had been born at the wrong time, I also saw him. For I am the least of all, apostle, uh, of all the apostles. In fact, I am not even worthy to be called an apostle after the way I persecuted God's church. So God, yeah, Jesus also appeared to Paul. And Jesus continues to appear to people. I've read the testimonies. I've heard the stories. It's nothing short sure of remarkable. There's a certain book, if you, if you have an interest, I talk about both uh bolstering your faith and 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 uh seeing uh things differently um there's a book called dreams and visions and it's a it's a it's an account of many many in the muslim faith that have been that have seen dreams and vision many of these muslims and these are in countries where the gospel never gets to you know certain pockets because it's illegal to share the christ it's illegal to have a bible but these Muslims uh, have been visited by Jesus Christ, um, and they, they're led to other Christians within the Muslim community. In other words, there's a lot of Christians in these Muslim countries that are not openly Christians. They have like a secret church. It's nothing different than in communist China, where you can't preach the gospel in China, but yet there's the underground church. And, um, and, and I mean, the same was in in Russia during the Soviet Union and in other communist countries where it's not freedom, but God is visiting these people through Jesus Christ. And the, the book is called Dreams and Visions. I encourage you to, to read it. There was another book called The Insanity of God that, that mom read. Um, and it talks about amazing things happen. And we don't, we don't hear about that here because the gospel is openly and freely available here. Jesus doesn't need to do that. He uses each other. He uses us to share the gospel with each other. Um, but, um, anyway, um, see Jesus appeared to Paul and he can still do that today. That's my point. That's why I wanted, that's why I talked about that book, because what happened to Paul can happen to people today where Jesus can make an appearance. So I want to go to first Thessalonians four, and then we're going to close with prayer. And, um, really, if you have anything to pray for post in the uh, comments and we can pray for that as we close. And then I have a special announcement also after this, where I will, um, talk about um, uh, what's happening later today with me. Um, first, Corinthians, third, first Thessalonians 4, verse 13 through 18. And now, dear brothers and sisters, we want you to know what will happen to the believers who have died so you will not grieve like people who have no hope. Again, he's setting apart brothers and sisters from those that have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and was raised to life again, we also believe that when Jesus returns, God will bring back with him the believers who have died. We tell you this directly from the Lord. We who are still living when the Lord returns will not meet him ahead of those who have died. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a commanding shout, with a voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, first, the believers who have died will rise from their graves. Then together with them, we who are still alive and remain on the earth will be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Then we will be with the Lord forever. So encourage each other with these words. Amen. I hope you're encouraged by these words today. I hope you're encouraged by uh, the Lord and renewing your mind continually. It's like a continuous font coming out of the Word of God, coming through the Holy Spirit that lives within us. Our faith is renewed. Our faith is strengthened as we continue uh, believing in Him and renewing our belief every day as we read and spend time with uh, other Christians. And we're encouraged by other Christians' faith and as we meet other people that uh, we love so it goes all back to, and I know this might get boring, I might sound like a broken record, but in order for your faith to grow, uh, you must be uh, active in three activities, three disciplines, and that is reading the Word of God, that is being in prayer. Being in prayer is, you know, as much as you possibly can, 
And then, then that grows. That's always been my weak spot is prayer, but my prayer life has gotten better. So just keep at it. Keep praying. Spend time on your knees before the Father in heaven. If you can physically spend time on your knees, some can't. But get on your knees before God in your secret place and tell him everything. Give him thanks. Uh, tell him everything that's on your heart. Give, Share your burdens. Cast all your burdens on the Lord. And he will give you hope. He will give you peace. Uh, I tell you, it's a special time when I just um, I, I get before the, the Lord in my secret place. I'll just share this quickly. Um, I, I get on my knees. I get prostrate. I put my face on the ground. And a lot of times my elbows are touching my knees. And I'm just sitting there. And I don't go to him immediately with, uh, with words. I allow myself to be still. I allow myself to be calm because we all have a certain level of anxiety all the time, a certain level. We're not truly relaxed. We're not truly comfortable. But when you get before the Lord in your secret place, wherever that is, it could be a bathroom. It's away from people, certainly. And we all have a favorite sacred place, like maybe it's a closet or maybe it's a bedroom. Uh, maybe it's a living room when there's no one around. Um, but I get on my knees. I get my face on the ground. And like I say, and I just relax. I breathe deep because when you breathe deep, you relax. And the more you relax, the more you're able to share. You know, when you're talking to someone and you know there's someone, there's someone uh, bothered um, with something, right? Um, it takes time for them to come uh, come out with it, right? They, they need to feel safe. And when we get on our knees in our secret place, we, we should just relax. We should not even think about what we're going to say. We should just, just, you're coming before the Father in heaven. You want, you don't want to babble. You want to pretend that he's right there. Spiritually, he's right there. He's with us. He's with us now. And when you come to him in prayer, in that secret place, that's what Jesus talks about in the Sermon, um, the Sermon on the Mount. He says, go to your room in private, and your faith is that he's there listening to you. Breathe deep, get relaxed, and then just start talking to him. Thank you, God, for this day. Lord, thank you for he, he, do you know, he, he tells us when we need to pray. When we're anxious, his spirit's calling, pray. I want you to spend time with me. I want you to share these burdens with me. And the more we understand that, the more we understand that whatever anxieties we have is a call from him to come to him. It changes your life. You don't hold on to your anxiety any longer than you need to. And you can be driving your car, and you can have that prayer as you drive your car. And it's not the same. You can't relax in your car like you can. But nevertheless, there's a practice. There's a discipline of prayer. And I haven't gotten into all these details before. But it's kind of one of my secrets to share my life with God is to get on my knees and just and just give myself time to relax and then just start opening up and you'll find yourself opening up you'll find yourself talking about things that you didn't think you were going to talk about you're going to be just and it's just if that's the relationship that you enjoy with your father in heaven and you just you just talk to him what's going on daddy daddy i i'm upset about this and life isn't working out and i got these concerns and and my friend lost his job and, 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 and this lady lost her husband and I got all these things, Lord, and I want you to help Sally. I want you to help um, Michael. And I, I want you to, um, I want you to, I want you to do some things, Lord. I, I need you. I need you desperately. And if you realize how much you need the Lord, the more you'll be led to call on him, the more you'll be led to be on your knees to him. And uh, our need for him is daily. And I thank him for my deep breaths that I can take today. 
it's wonderful to be able to deep, breathe deeply. And so, guys, um, <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I, I, I'm getting caught up. Uh, thank you for uh, spending time with me today. Um, get on your knees and pray. Um, speaking of prayer, um, and be in fellowship. I wanted to say that's, that was where I was going with that. The, the, the three disciplines, being in the word, being in prayer, being in fellowship. We need to be in fellowship. We do that on the phone. We didn't have to worry about social distancing on the phone. We, we meet on a conference call on Monday night. So we've been social distancing now since 2008 <laughs> on our Bible team calls. And so the details are there in the original post. You can join us on those calls where we fellowship, but we mainly just stick to reading the Word of God and talking about it. It's discipleship related uh, discussion. So um, you can meet us there, but you cannot forsake the gathering of the godly. You need to be in close fellowship with other believers, those that love God, those that love His Word. If you talk to a believer that doesn't love His Word, yeah, move on. Talk to another believer. Because believers should be relying and loving the truth that they have in the Word of God. But sadly enough, many believers don't believe the Word that they carry around in their Bible. Um, they believe part of it, and that's a, that's a shame. So um, those are the three activities, reading, praying, and being in fellowship. Um, but speaking of prayer, I've been asked to pray live on Facebook. Um, a dear friend of mine and a former boss, um, Brad Flack, um, who I've known, I don't know, for five or six years now, but he asked me to um, lead a prayer. He's been doing it daily. So he's gotten other people to lead a prayer every day at nine o'clock central time. So that's 10 o'clock for those of you in the East Coast it is um, seven o'clock for those of you on the West Coast. Um, that is on my page. It'll be right here, same bat channel um, at 9 p.m. Central Standard Time on this channel and all, all i'm going to do is i'm just going to pray i'm going to have an outline of everything i need to pray for if you want prayer be a part of that call i i appreciate if you join me anyway you know the more people that join me the better off i i, I just like uh knowing people are watching me um but that'll be uh uh announced later today but it's at nine o'clock you can just count on that um and i don't know how long it'll last i really don't i've, I've seen these prayers last from 12 20 minutes I, I have no idea you don't have to stay on for the whole time you can just pray for me a little time and dismiss yourself, um, and that's fine too. So um, that I'm just sharing what I'll be doing later today. Guys, have a beautiful Easter. Let's close in prayer. Father, we give you all the praise. We thank you so much for transforming us into uh, believers and uh, uh, brothers and sisters of Christ. Thank you for your Holy Spirit. Thank you for a renewed hope um, through your word that teaches us. Thank you, Lord, for uh, walking with us that we might enjoy a fellowship with you. We thank you so much for all that you do, all that you've done, and all that you will do in the future, Lord. We have a great hope, Lord. Your word gives us a great hope, knowing that our future is secure. We have all the hope we need to be with you in all of eternity. Lord, thank you um, for what you're going to do with this message today and um, in the future. In Christ's name I pray, amen. Thank you all for uh, being with me today. Uh, I love you. Oh, wait, wait, wait. I'm sorry, I just noticed the comments didn't. Uh, shoot, Michael said, if you stay with the word and walk with him, you learn more and more and you desire to know more. Uh, uh, my friend Ray, thank you, Bill. Thank you for sharing. I'm sorry I got to these messages. I, I'm. Uh, Boy, I, I need to learn how to use this. Uh, Jack said, I, I tried to think of the happiest day in my life when it pales in comparison to what heaven must be. Amen, Jack. I didn't want that to be missed. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Ray, for chiming in. Um, for uh, David, uh, Michael says, prayers for Sally Morrison, uh, for Sally, that's his wife, as she has now been diagnosed with vascular disease on the top of her kidney disease. Oh, my goodness. Also, prayers for me as I do my first Facebook Live Sunrise service tomorrow at 635. Uh, God bless you, Michael, for um, for having a, a Facebook Live. Um, if you need any help at all, technically, 
Um, I'd be glad to share, but I'm sure you can figure it out. But um, let's pray for Sally right now. Um, thank you, uh, Father, for Sally. Lord, she is such a dear woman. She is such a special child of God. And uh, Michael uh, just absolutely adores his wife, the gift you've given him in Sally. Lord, we lift Sally up to you and all of her sickness, Lord. And I know you have the power to heal her. Lord, I just pray that she be healed. I pray that you touch her body, Lord, that you bring healing to her. And Lord, I just lift Sally and Michael up to you today. And I lift Michael's message as he does this Facebook Live message tomorrow morning. Be with him, give him the strength, and give him the, the encouragement and the words to deliver. In Christ's name I pray, amen. Thank you, Michael. Sorry, I almost missed that. And I'm not uh, keeping up with my message for the comments. Anyway, guys, God bless you. Have a great uh, Easter weekend and uh, be blessed.